Our friend Kit Goldfarb has always been passionate about working in culturally diverse programs that strengthen human rights and dignity through economic, social, and political empowerment. Earlier in her career, Kit worked in programs of cooperation between Jewish and Palestinian citizens living in Israel. Her work in launching Sango Kenya with her colleague, Professor Constance Jua, taught her how important it is to listen to the people with whom you are working to reach solutions together. It also impressed upon her how lasting the impact of person-to-person -person experience can be. Today, she will be introducing us to the already impressive work of Sango Kenya, the nonprofit founded less than two years ago. And I'm gonna to add to that, that you'll be looking, look carefully in the rap news because Kit was recently interviewed by the editor and there'll be a more to learn about Sango Kenya in your next edition. Welcome, Kit. Thank you so much, Madeline. Uh, thank you for that lovely introduction and thank all of you for having me come here today to talk to you about Sango Kenya. It is indeed a passion of mine and uh, two friends of mine recently launched a new uh, project and they talked about it as being a project and endeavor of love and that's what this is in all uh, definitions of love. You heard in the beginning some music and if I can share the screen which I'll try um, I would like to show you some photographs because I think the music and the photographs together will give you a, a better idea of where we're working and the people with whom we're working. So let me try and please bear with me. Good. Yeah, it worked. But what I need to do, sorry. These are photographs, not of the program specifically, but just of the area where we work. You can see it's very open, it's arid, not a lot of infrastructure. And I hope that gave you a bit of an idea. And at the end, I'll show you some uh, photographs of the program specifically. And I'm actually gonna turn on the timer so that I don't speak too long. As uh, Madeline said, there's so much to talk about and um, it's hard to know where to start and where to go. So I also, I'm very happy that we will have questions at the end so that you can ask me anything you want to, to learn more. Uh, the area where we work is in the western part of Kenya on the shores of Lake Victoria. The focus of the program is on food security and nutrition, targeting specifically uh, women who are of reproductive age and their children. We follow the tenets of a principle called uh, the thousand days, which is a nutrition concept that recognizes that the first thousand days of nutrition are the most important. And those thousand days begin uh, at conception and go through two years. So the women who are participating in our program are either pregnant or have children under two years, at least when they start in the program. And the, the name Sango Kenya is uh, taken from Sango, which is the Lua, one of the Lua terms for Lake Victoria. Lua are the tribe of the people with whom we work predominantly in this area, which is Semi Sub County, which is in Kasumu County. And as you saw there, it's a very, the part where we work is a very rural underdeveloped area. And the pro, Sango Kenya, the, the roots of it, the history of it really go back to some research that my colleague, Dr. Constance Gewa, who is a nutrition professor at George Mason University and my nutrition professor when I went back to get my MPH 10 years ago in global health. She's from that area. She's from uh, Seme Sub County and she grew up there and she, she's really quite the success story. She went to school there. She got her undergraduate and master's degree there 
And then working on a project there, met someone from UCLA, came here and got her PhD in public health and nutrition, and then went to, uh, came to George Mason University to teach. But even after all that journey, her roots are very strong there and she probably will return there one day. And she has gone back several times to do research. And one of the times she was there, she discovered that uh, the women were not following the uh, WHO, the World Health Organization's prescription for breastfeeding, which is uh, exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months. And she went back to do research to find out why. And she found out that the levels of food security were high, much higher than she would have expected in that area. And, and uh, that meant that in uh, uh, for many families, at least one night a week, someone would go to bed hungry. For many families, at least one day a week, one member of the household would have to uh, give up uh, a meal so that everyone could, usually the children, and so an adult would give up a meal so that the children could get their meals. And she conducted this research on food security in 2017. And in 2019, she was going to go back and deliver the results of the, uh, the research to the members of the community. And we happened to be in touch at the time and she invited me to go along with her, which I did. And we had several meetings, um, three particularly uh, critical for Sango Kenya. And um, when I read what the commitments for, uh, for your, uh, the, universe, the Unitarian Universalist, it's really part of, of a critical part of uh, Sango Kenyan that is respect for the individual and respect for people, uh, even people who might be different from you. And I say that because when we had our first meeting or both of the meetings really, uh, and uh, Constance was delivering the results of her research, both groups said this was the first time anyone ever came back and told them about the results of any research. They had participated, they had been subjects in research many times before you know, the World Bank goes there, different, a lot of NGOs, but this was the first time anyone ever came back to talk to them about that. And then when we went even further than that um, and asked them why they thought they, they were so food insecure, they were very eager to participate and very surprised because also no one had ever asked them about that. And the process was very interactive. We asked them what they thought the causes were. And then the, as a group, they voted to, to um, designate the top four causes. And then we asked them what kinds of interventions would they want to uh, have to help them with that and voted on that. And that was really the beginning of Sango Kenya. And we uh, worked with people there um, and, and um, came back here and worked with people here and talked to you know, experts in Africa, experts in agriculture, experts in development, and, um, and, and continued to work with them. And uh, after a few months, we, this was June of 2019, we wanted to go back in January of 2020 to start a program because we had told them we would come back. And the, the rains begin in, uh, for the major rainy season and the growing season in March. So we needed to get back. So we we're really working very fast. And um, one day a friend of mine called up and said, well, I'd really like to support your work. How do I do that? And we thought, oh, right. That's a really critical part too. <laughs> we have to get support. And so we started uh, the process there. And I, I have to say that the people of Rappahannock have been very supportive and, and been really encouraging. Madeline has been uh, a huge supporter of ours from the very beginning, and I, I really appreciate that. We all appreciate that. And somehow, in just a few months, we were able to put together the basics for the program. And in January of 2020, Constance and I went back to the area. And that first week was a flurry of meetings with the women from the community, with uh, people from the ministries of agriculture and nutrition, which are the institutions with which uh, Ministry of Health, which with we have uh, our primary relationship. And one person in particular from the Ministry of Health, a nutritionist there who has worked with Constance since 2017 has really been instrumental in putting this together. He has arranged for us to meet all the right people in his ministry and the Ministry of Agriculture. And he also identified a women's group there who could help us. And uh, a women's group there is very different from what we might think of. 
they're, it's a formal organization. They get uh, support from the government. They have constitutions and rules and bylaws, but importantly for us, they were already organized. So it was easy for us to reach out and bring them in. And so in January of 2020, we started our pilot project. And um, the pilot uh, consisted of 20, uh, 19 farmers who were part of this women's group, uh, training and uh, support for the first growing season in uh, green leafy vegetables. And all of this was selected in cooperation with the people there and other groups there. And that's a really important tenant also that we're community-based. Many people uh, ask me, you know, why does it take people from the outside to come in and tell them how they should be doing these things? And I emphasize that I'm the only outsider. Everyone else is uh, there or from there. Constance, uh, even though she's living here right now, she's very much of the community. And, and one of the things that drives her is she remembers how different it was raising crops there because climate change has really affected their uh, way that they work. Plus the Kenyan government has gone from emphasizing um, the more traditional vegetables to maize because it's a profitable cash crop and it's a Western crop and the impact of the West comes in. And what our goal is, is to go back and, and really emphasize sustainability. And by sustainability, I mean that we don't, we're not like an organization that goes in and provides money or things. We provide knowledge, we train them and provide support. And we, and we don't do anything that they can't continue without us. And so that first week when we went back in 2020, we had meetings. The last meeting was uh, that Constance was only there for a week and had to come back. But in her last meeting, we met with the women and introduced the program and uh, discussed with them what we were planning to do and made sure that our plans for the program were what they wanted to do and that they could, um, they could support that. And then the program began. As I said, it was 19 uh, women. They're all smallholder farmers. And by smallholder farmers, I, they have from one quarter acre to one acre, but most of them have closer to a quarter of an acre. And that's the amount of land that we help them cultivate. They can cultivate the rest of it through, and using these methods but we really want it to be equal. We want to be able that we give everyone the same thing. And the only thing we actually provide them are the seeds. The rest of it is training. And we uh, found a wonderful uh, agricultural extension worker named Dominic, who has done all the training and field support. And he brought with him uh, an agricultural uh, training program that he adapted to what we do because we, uh, the, the women actually know that climate change is ha happening to them and they need to adapt to that. And they also know that they need to use more organic methods for farming. They, they want to use uh, manure, they want to use composting, but they didn't know how. And that was one of the things that they asked that we include in the training. And we selected five uh, green leafy vegetables that are clim more climate resilient than some of the other things that they might be growing. And Dominic, uh, over the course of five days, taught them how to uh, prepare their land, cultivate it, plant, uh, maintain, and harvest those vegetables in particular, each one, and what pests to look out for. And the women came for five days in a row, and they, they spent two hours there. And two hours of their time every day for five days is a lot. The women are responsible for everything. They're responsible for getting the children fed. They're responsible for getting the children to school. They're responsible for taking care of anyone who is sick, preparing all of the meals. It's, it's a lot. The men, and, and, and in some cases, they also uh, provide additional income. So for them to give two hours a day for five days in a row is, is really a lot. And they came, they knew that they were committed. And, and part of the agreement is that all we ask of them is that they show up and they pay attention and they really did. At the end, I couldn't understand, it was all given in Lua, but someone did translate some of it for me. But also at the end of the, every session, they had a lot of questions. 
And it was astonishing. They, they really picked up on things. And the next morning, one of the things that Dominic would do is he would have someone get up and recap what they had done the day before. So we felt that they really were getting it. And then we also had nutrition training. So we taught them how to better, to prepare the vegetables so that they would retain more nutrition. We also importantly taught them how to dry the vegetables so that they could continue to consume the vegetables after the harvest season. Because the rains begin in March, last about three months, they continue harvesting for another couple of months and then they don't have food and the rain, they don't have more rain until the short rains later on. And the results were incredible. They, they, we do surveys at the beginning and the end, and, they and we also do a crop cut, which it means you go in and you cut a certain amount of, uh, of the vegetable and you compare it to sort of the average for the area. And we, we went into areas where they had not participated in our program and the, the crops, the yield was great, but we also knew the yield was great. The women told us, but all of the people in the community started getting really interested in joining our program because they saw that they were getting more crops and their crops were, were, were greater. And um, so that was very gratifying. I stayed there for two and a half months and it was, I left before the rain started and I had to leave early because of COVID. And so the last, week I was there was a flurry of activity because, uh, or the last three days, sorry, because I thought I was gonna have 10 days to, to transfer all of the, the program management to someone. And I had three days to do that. And um, we worked with, uh, or I found a, a woman who was a community health worker. And community health workers are instrumental because they have really great contacts with the community. And they, um, and one of them took over a lot of the things that I was doing. And we also spent time, we, in order to um, more further transfer the knowledge, instead of just having us train them, we used the trainer of trainers method. And so we had uh, 19 farmers, but we had three lead farmers. And each of those lead farmers get additional training. Plus they meet with every uh, one of the farmers in their group twice a week. And we gave them questionnaires so that they could go through and ask them and any problems that might come up, they're able to help resolve sooner rather than later. And then Dominic would continue to go out into the field uh, through the entire time. But when I left, we had all of this set up, but we were really unsure because of COVID. I mean, nobody knew what was happening with COVID, but we also didn't know what would happen with the program once I left, because I would go into the field two or three times a week also. And the women and Dominic and Frederick, our nutrition advisor, kept it going and kept it going strong. And they, the, the um, lead farmers continued to go out into the field every day and their crops could really thrived. And that first year for our pilot, it went from January to August. And at the end of August, we had graduation for everyone, which was very exciting for them and for us. We were very sad not to be there. But we didn't have a real presence in the field until uh, the beginning of this year. And we didn't really know what would happen after because we also didn't know what the impact of COVID would be. It had, it had a tremendous impact there. People lost jobs. We couldn't have face-to-face -face meetings. The food supplies were uh, cut off. They buy their foods typically from a local market and they weren't necessarily reaching the local, the foods weren't reaching the local market so that people couldn't go sell. So our program became even more important than we had thought it would be in the beginning. And, um, and, and that proved to be something that was very gratifying. And uh, we also were very gratified in October, it was uh, World Food Day, which is a program of the uh, FAO. And we asked the farmers that they would like to do something for it. And they said, sure. And we thought, yeah, they'd invite their friends. They had a hundred people there, including the, the head person from the Ministry of Health there talk about how important our program was, how important the consumption of green leafy vegetables is. And uh, the women though, did most of the presentations. They taught people in their community, men and women attended and more people wanted to come and join our program. So this year we went from 19 farmers last year to 
uh, 70 farmers this year, one village last year, two villages this year. We also hired a field advisor and she uh, has been running everything there. She's from the community. She worked with Constance also back in 2017. So she knew her and she has been just amazing. And um, she's kept the uh, program going. And additionally, we gone from just uh, supporting in the long rain season to supporting in the second season, which is also, um, which just started now. And we uh, introduced orange flesh sweet potatoes. And uh, because that introduces more nutrients and also, uh, this isn't a negative, it's a positive uh, calories. Because as opposed to here, and they are going through a nutrition transition in Kenya where they've gone from under, underweight to, overweight and obesity, but not where we're working. The people, you know, some of the people are rather large, but generally the, the real challenge is still to get uh, enough calories, but it also provides more nutrition and more variety. And I see that I'm running out of time a little bit, but I, I just also like to, on a personal note, um, you know, people ask, actually, um, uh, Ben Peters asked me if I had developed personal relationships and, and you do, I spent so much time with people and, and I heard uh, people talking about illness. I don't know that many people though very well. In just the less than two years, um, I know, uh, I think now it's up to eight people who have lost family members. One of them including a, a 16 year old boy and many of them to things that if they had uh, healthcare here, like there, like we have here, wouldn't happen. One was because of a kidney transplant actually, Constance's brother. Um, uh, the 16 year old child had a heart defect that here would have not been a significant surgery. And just this past week, um, Winnie, our uh, field officer and Helma, the woman who took over for me last year, their fathers died. Helma's stepmother died two weeks ago. Death is so much a part of it because they don't have health care. They don't have proper nutrition. The, the um, orange flesh sweet potatoes the vitamin A is so critical to them for their immune systems. And it, it really um, strikes you at the difference. And, and so, you know, in that area, we're looking at really the impact we can make. And we're also looking at how we can help them market their surplus vegetables, because not only did they save money because they didn't have to sell, uh, buy vegetables, but they had um, surplus and they were selling them, but we saw that not all of them were as good at selling them as others. So we're going to introduce that. And this is a great time for me because I'm actually going back in two weeks for five weeks to start to plan for 2022. And we are going to be adding 60 more farmers. And um, we also wanna start looking into different programs of uh, more effective use of irrigation and uh, also um, how to, the, the difference between soil and dirt and how to really maintain the health of the, the soil there. And I think I've probably said enough. I'm going to put our uh, website up here because we do have a blog there. Also, anybody who would like to receive our newsletter, please ask me, I'll put my email there as well. And um, I, we also have a Facebook page. So I follow when I go, I tend to post quite a bit on Facebook. That's the easiest way for me to communicate. So I really thank you very much for this. I want to share a few more photographs and then really look forward to your questions. And I know I'm talking fast because I know I'm running out of time. So uh, let me go back to screen share. So uh, that's Constance off to the left. The green t-shirts are the t-shirts that are the women have from their women's group uh, and they wear those a lot. They're very proud. Um, if you can, can you see my cursor there? She's the chair lady. She uh, was instrumental in really making things happen. She helped uh, us a lot organize and uh, do a lot of things. This is one of the uh, in-class trainings, the yellow t-shirts we gave in Sango Kenya t-shirts this year. And those are at the Sango Kenya and that's Dominic. And you can see it's during COVID, so they're wearing. And we also gave them all, uh, they don't have them here, but we had uh, one of the people, uh, we had make uh, masks. These are masks that we uh, had made and get, gave to them so that they could wear masks all the time. And these are seeds that we provided. These are cowpeas. That was one of the uh, vegetables that they grew. 
And this is in the training, this is learning how to space and to um, make it the, the, the rows the right distance uh, apart. And that's Dominic again and the chair lady. And that's, um, this is this year, obviously, and learning how to, um, they use the, the straw as, as like mulch and then they water it uh, so that when they first plant so that they can take root. And that's what their crops look like towards the end of the season. Very rich, you can see around where it's not cultivated. And that was at the cooking demonstration, uh, some of the vegetables that they, uh, they aren't the vegetables they actually raised, but the type of vegetables that they raised. And we taught them how to prepare them in an interactive and hands-on. And that was my last day. Um, this was the person who took over, Dominic. She was one of our lead farmers. Actually, they, she was a lead farmer as well. And so that is it. And I would love to hear your questions.